Welcome again to you. It's good to be together for the worship of God, the reading of His Word. This week would be a fitting time to remember the, be the beginning of our nation's birth certificate. Those often remembered words, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object invinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. Well, as we say where I come from, them theirs fighting words. <laughs> them theirs fighting words. And so they were. And so they were. And these words that finalized a God-given liberty in the face of a man-centered tyranny and so the birth of a brand new nation, the adventure of a people in many ways with many remnants of the Reformation, the Puritan era, the awakenings and so forth, going armed forth on this grand experiment. And in many ways today we enjoy a Christian heritage. There are many biblical principles that we're very thankful for that are rooted in the fabric of our culture, our society. And all of the narratives, all of the stories need to continue to be retold so that we remember where we come from and so that we understand the context that God's given us and placed us in and then that we may know how we are to live within it. But as you know, we live in a day today where we are experiencing an all-out assault and have been to completely cancel anything that is remotely related or smells like a Christian heritage, to retell the stories, to, to rename the narratives, to cast the villains as heroes and to cast the heroes as villains. We live in a very interesting point in human society. And many think, why in the world would I even want to have children given the day in which we live? To which I respond, what a wonderful opportunity to raise up little arrows for the sake of the kingdom of God, is there any better time in history than to have children, to train them, to bring them into the life of the church, and then to send them out for the sake of the glory of God? Amen. The Bible clearly says that we're citizens of heaven, Philippians 3.20. And that citizenship informs the stewardship that we have as earthly citizens in this world. So where are we now as a nation? Where has God situated us? The Bible says in the book of Acts that God has determined the boundaries of where each one would live. God has providentially placed us 
within the boundaries, within the context, the culture, the nation in which we find ourselves. That is God's doing. And where we are now is we are, we ought to be an extremely thankful people for the beginnings, for the blessings generationally that have been passed down, for the sacrifices in the pursuit of the very things that we just read of life, of liberty, of property, of the pursuit of happiness. But we understand now where we are situated is we have then taken that well-fought, hard-fought freedom, and now as a nation, we have ran back into slavery. We've completely redefined liberty. The founding fathers, the writers of Scripture, all the more understood liberty so much different than it is understood today. Today, liberty is understood as the freedom to do whatever you want to do. Liberty is the freedom to be whoever you want to be and to live however you want to live. But friends, the Bible defines liberty. Historically, we have understood liberty not to be the freedom to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it, to be whoever you want to be. Rather, liberty is the freedom to do what you ought to do. And God's law gives us the blueprint for what we ought to do and how we ought to live and who we truly are. And these are the principles from which we have ran as a nation. And in its place, there is never a void. You understand as well as I do that we live in a severely divided nation, an extremely problematic time period. We have walked through COVID and lockdowns. We see a plethora, even in an era of uh, post Roe versus Wade, uh, many in many contexts, a culture of abortion, a culture of riots, of perverted sexuality, of social and cultural Marxism and critical race theory, and all of these destructive ideologies that are seeping into not only our culture, but into our schools, even into our seminaries and even into our churches. Full-fledged moral relativism, where there's no absolute truth. Everything is made up at the whims of whoever would define what it is that they believe they ought to do and how they ought to live. So we live right now, and we are today in light of approaching the 250th anniversary of our country. We also are beginning today a wonderful process of our church membership class, and we've enjoyed many visitors who've been coming for some time now. And so I think that it's a good opportunity for us to hit the pause button on our long march through Ezra, through Nehemiah, rebuilding the ruins in Haggai and so forth, and to stop and return to the basics of what the Bible says about where we are and about how we are to live. We generally have, as it pertains to understanding the culture, the political climate, I've noticed as a pastor two particular speeds. I believe that before 2020, the overarching speed for many, myself included, was we tended to bury our heads in the sand. Nothing matters but the gospel and salvation. I am not interested in what's going on in the culture. And I have, I have no interest in what's going on in the realm of the civil magistrate, society, uh, Hollywood, Nashville, anything else. We're just going to pull away in our smug, pietistic communities. Uh, we don't really care. And then we realized very quickly in 2020 that having had our heads in the sand, everything around us had been completely hijacked by the left and hell and destroyed before our very eyes. Because it is a movement of worship and education, and it always is. It's about where our allegiance is, who we are to worship, and with a new set of worship comes a new set of ordinances. Rather than baptism in the Lord's Supper, the new ordinances begin with abortion and the murder of children and sacrifices to the God of Molech and many, many others. But there's another speed that's easy to catch, and I believe that since 2020, many have struggled with this gear. 
And it's the year of being completely consumed in the headlines and the events of our culture and then just completely being overwhelmed and feeling completely helpless. And I believe that there's a year in between those that I want to suggest to us today. The Bible says of the men of Issachar that they were men who knew the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. Friends, today we know that we need men. We need churches that know the word of God, that understand the times in which we live and that understand the marching orders and how to navigate those times in a way that brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ and advances his kingdom. The movement in which I cut my teeth upon in large part was the gospel-centered movement. It was a movement in large part, I believe, charitably speaking, that was introduced because there was a misunderstanding of the gospel. There was a sidelining of the gospel. And so everything became about the gospel. It was a movement that was centered upon supposedly the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in many ways, what I believe happened with that movement that swept through the churches across America and beyond is that it became a movement of gospel minimalism. And the idea for many years propagated by very popular preachers began to be we want to package the gospel as minimally as possible. We want to sever it down to as few parts and pieces and doctrines as possible. And then we want to package it as pretty as possible. And then we want to market it as far as possible. And this was on the heels of a so-called second great awakening on the, the heels of a so-called movement of Charles Finney and and, 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 and even on the heels of a movement of Billy Graham crusades, and we begin to recover these things. And the idea was, if you'll just pray this prayer, if you'll just recite these words, the most important thing and the only thing that matters is if we could just get hell out of you and get your ticket stamped to heaven. I believe that led into one of the prevailing problems in our day, among Christians and particularly in the church, if you'll look with me in Matthew chapter 28. The gospel minimalism movement, I believe, has now turned to a major problem of what has been called the truncated gospel movement. And the idea here is that we want to focus on the gospel and beyond the gospel, who cares what the gospel then says about how we're to live? The only thing that Christians in the church should concern themselves with is how not to go to hell, how to get as many people as they can from going to hell, and then how to get as many people as possible with a ticket stamp to heaven. Now, let's do a bit of a triage and establish our priorities, church family. Do we care about people going to hell? The answer is absolutely, fundamentally, most importantly, yes. Do we want anyone, including ourselves, our neighbors, or anyone around the world, to go to hell? Absolutely not. Some of you are doing this, and I think you're getting confused. But No, we don't want anyone to go to hell. And we ought not to be able to say that without a trembling lip. And so we are centrally concerned with salvation and, and we need to be. There's a sort of revival of, of conservatism in the world today as the, the sides begin to march and the, the lines form. But if we're not careful, we'll fall into a sort of what's been called a Christless conservatism. We're conservative, but we don't have the foundation of Jesus Christ. And there are people that have been attracted to our church because of maybe political stands that we take or, or, or other things. But we must have in common Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, this is foundational. The doctrines of Christianity, the, the, the doctrines of Scripture from beginning to end. But I want to tell you something that I think is extremely important in the context in which we live, and I think, and I even think that many of the most 
well-educated, spiritually-minded, admired pastors in our country are completely missing. And it's the fact that that salvation doesn't end there. Once we are saved, if we are, that's just the very beginning. Now, as Paul says, we are to teach the whole counsel of God not just to teach them how to get to heaven, but to teach them to live and how to live on the trip all the way there. The Bible teaches us how to live everyday life in display of the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Christian life is not less than salvation, but included in that salvation is how to live a saved life. And so the church speaks everywhere the Bible speaks. So in Matthew 28, we've already read how Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's gathering his disciples around him. And we come now to the Great Commission, the Great Commission. And and I grew up Southern Baptist for most of my life, and this is where great... Southern Baptists go, and this is where Southern Baptists miss it because of the severing of the beginning and end of the passage that is so central here. Because in verse 18, Jesus calls his disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do you know what that means? Let me break that down for for us from the Greek. It means that Jesus is Lord in every dimension of all of life. It means that Jesus has the first and final say-so over everything that we think, say, and do from the movement of nations and kingdoms as we've seen in Ezra and Nehemiah to the everyday affairs of a mother and a father working and leading their families every day, a business owner running a an account day in and day out. Jesus Christ is Lord over all of it. And what we've done, if we're not careful, is we've compartmentalized Jesus to have say-so, but only in this small little area of life. And you Christians need to believe whatever you want in your heart and your home, and we'll let you gather to preach what you want in your churches when we allow you to, but everything else is off limits. But the Bible in the Great Commission says that Jesus Christ is Lord. He has authority over all things. And then the marching orders in chapter 28, verse 19, is that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. We baptize them in the name of our triune God. We teach them. And here is at the heart of that great commission. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. From beginning to end, the whole counsel of God. Now spend the rest of your life teaching them everything the Word of God says and how people are expected to live in light of it. Dear friends, that is the pursuit of holiness and the pursuit of true and genuine happiness, the way that God has designed us to live. We live in a lawless society an antinomian society. And James chapter 1 says that that we're to look into the perfect law of God. And the perfect law of God reveals our own sin and, and we're cast before the feet and the cross of Jesus Christ who gives us liberty and freedom and then we are free. We are free to be in bondage to Jesus Christ and walk in His laws. This is basic Christianity. Christianity 101 for a long time. And the Bible calls that law the law of liberty because it sets us free. Mankind will always live in accordance with law. But as it's been rightly said, it's either Christ or chaos. Uh, Whose law will we live in accordance with? Who's making up these rules around here? As for me and my house, we would desire to be ruled by God's law, not the tyranny of man. So here's what we do. We start with the smallest and the most local level of reformation. We concentrate on being faithful to Scripture in our own hearts, asking God to change us 
Make us pleasing before him and give us strength and grace to live in a way that would bring him honor and joy to us. And we continue to live by the Spirit under the Lordship of Christ in our homes and our churches. And we advance to the ends of the earth as the cup overflows and the worship of God extends from every generation to every, every nation. So the title of my sermon, in the words of Francis Schaeffer in his classic book, is How Should We Then Live? I want to re review the mission that God has put before us, to review our spiritual state, to plot our lives in the big bigger picture of what the Bible has said about how we are to live, particularly in the midst of this critical time. It's been attributed to Martin Luther, who supposedly said, it is the truth which is assailed in any age which tests our fidelity. It is to confess we are called, not merely to profess. If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition, every part of the truth of God except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing Christianity, where the battle rages, the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace to him if he flinches at that one point. And so in many places around the country, as we babble on about the same old things, we avoid like the plague the places where the battle is truly raging before us. It's a battle over human sexuality. It's a battle over human anthropology, which simply means the most basic understanding of who we are as male and as female. What God has created and defined as marriage. It's a battle that is raging for the hearts and minds of our young people. It's a battle that is now sterilizing themselves that they can't have children because they're going against the grain of nature. But they would have children to propagate the call so they would come after our children. And it's a battle of ideologies and it's a battle first and foremost over worship and over the proper ordinances. And there's so many battlefronts that are raging, whether it be homosexuality or transgenderism, whether it be cultural Marxism, you could go on and on and on about how illegal immigration is changing the borders of our country and destroying and rotting it and continuing. We would desire that God would be, bring change from the top down. And there are times in history where God has done that. We've seen through many places in history where God has given a people a godly ruler. And the Proverbs say that when the godly rule, the people rejoice. It doesn't necessarily bring saving faith to everyone in that nation, but it does bring the principles of God's law, which lead to human flourishing, which make things all the more right for the extension of God's kingdom and the preaching of the gospel. And so we ask the Lord to bring that. And we desire those who would rule in a way that would be honoring to God in accordance with his law. There's so many battles raging over Christian nationalism today. And there's so many definitions of what that means. But in part, you wonder, what do you want to live in a pagan nation? Like, what are you arguing for here? Jeez. <laughs> But there's another way to look at revival and reformation and change and the marching orders that God has given us as we labor for a top-down approach, and it's a bottom-up approach. Scripture lays out three spheres of authority. There are three jurisdictions that we have walked through ad nauseum in our church over the last few years, and I find this to be a good time to review that. Three jurisdictionals jurisdictional authorities 
where both authority and responsibility has been given and these jurisdictions in many ways overlap that historically many have believed provide the framework for the answer to the question that I've already posed and it's this, how then shall we live? The principle of subsidiarity would teach us that the foundation of flourishing oftentimes begins with the smallest unit and it progresses outward. The things in which we can take the most immediate responsibility rather than griping over the things that we have little immediate control over. And so God has given us clear institutions that we'll look at in review this morning. And it's the institution of the family, the institution of the church, and then that of civil society. And God has given us instructions for how we are to be faithful to him and how we are to live. But as our founding fathers understood, and, and many of them, and, and as the scriptures teach, all three of those jurisdictional authorities, friends, you have to understand, I have to urge this upon you first. It, all three of those governments begin and rest on the foundation of self-government, self-government. Self-rule. And ever since Genesis chapter 3, we have proven to be a people who cannot and will not rule ourselves. But the truth is, from beginning to end, the Bible says we will always be ruled one way or another. Paul clarifies this in Romans when he teaches that we will either be under the dominion of sin or of righteousness. We will always be governed by another. So, so choose the dominion that you would be placed under. And naturally, outside of Jesus Christ, without bending the knee to him and loving and desiring to live for him by repenting of your sin, by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, which is where all of this begins by asking God to change your heart and show mercy on your soul and bring you brand new life. Without that government, we will prove to be those who will sow the seeds of the very things that will destroy every ounce of liberty that we think that we have. Liberty is not upheld without virtue. And where does virtue come from? But from Christianity. And where does that begin? But in each heart that is bowing the knee to King Jesus and loving him as Lord. And so then as Christians, we, we seek to put ourselves under the Lordship of Christ in every way. The Bible calls this the fruit of the Spirit, namely self-control. Fathers, we teach our children, by the power of God and the strength of the Spirit, you must learn to govern yourself. You're eating, you're drinking, you're talking, your time. You must learn to rule yourself rightly under God's rules by the help of his spirit. Because if that would not happen there, you will be ruled by no one anywhere. You will live in utter anarchy and slavery. And so I call you to the rule of Jesus Christ. And that's where we're seeking to live. And I want to begin, number one, extending from the heart how we should then live in the family. How we should then live in the family. Turn in your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we've taken many, many years, many, many books, many, many places in Scripture to outline this, but... If you want the Cliff Notes version of how we should then live in the family, Colossians chapter 3, 18 through 21, shows us the first and most fundamental unit, which begins in Genesis. As I've often said, it's kind of hard to complain about what's going on in the White House when everything is in your house is in complete disarray. You know, it can be a sort of smokescreen to complain against your neighbor's house or even the White House so that we don't have to deal with the things that are in our own house. But in our own house, this is the prescription for living according to the, 
the beautiful lordship of Christ. He says, again, and where I come from, we call them their fighting words, a death knell to every form of feminism and watch all of it burn to the ground and gladly so. Wives, submit to your husbands. And it's a beautiful thing in the Lord. It's a blessing and it's good and glorious when exercised rightly as is fitting in the Lord. And listen to the charge to husbands to be awakened in their sinful passivity or maybe their abrasive misuse of authority when he says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, all children, listen right here at God's word straight to you. This is not an adult thing or a parent's thing. This is a you thing. It says, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And children, I must say, all of you I know in here, God has been so kind to give you parents that love Jesus, that want to do the best that they can to point you to him, even in their sin and mistakes. But you have to understand that we are always under an imperfect authority. The imperfect authority of parents, the imperfect authority of church leaders, the imperfect authority of civil magistrates. But he says then to fathers in verse 21, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So the family's first responsibility is to picture the gospel through marriage and then to train children in the Lord. And this is a jurisdiction that is given to the family, mediated through the head of that household, working in conjunction alongside with his wife. And there's an authority that has been given to back that responsibility and it's discipline appropriately with the rod, the rod of correction. When used rightly is intended to mold the behavior and then the heart of that child into the ways and the law of God. Friends, we read these very few fundamental verses, and right here we get at the fissures, the cracks at the foundation of our entire society. How many of you men have been through our men's class on Sunday evenings as we've walked through William Gooch? And he talks over and over and over about the family as the nursery, the seminary of all of society. When the family's rotten, everything else will be rotten, save a miraculous revival from God. I mean, where do you think future pastors, where do you think future parents, where do you think future plumbers, where do you think future presidents are going to come from? For better or worse, they're going to come from families. And God has told us how to live in our families and obviously, one of the greatest problems in our society, next to the lack of salvation in Jesus Christ, but even in the context of many supposed believers, is that this first mini society has completely broken down in a life of fatherless homes, a lack of male leadership, women outside the homes doing everything but managing their homes and loving and training their children. The passivity of men, refusing to fight the battles that God has called men and to lead in the way that God has called men to lead. And in that void, obviously now we've seen several waves of feminism that has sought to fill that void of a lack of those men of valor, valiant men that we've seen in the book of Nehemiah. And so one tactic of the enemy is to use all of these schemes and then begin to manifest sin in different ways. And there are sins that the Bible says sin is common to men and women, adults and children. But I've made a case before, and I can do it again, that sin does tend to manifest itself distinctly in the sense that there are sins that seem to be more common to women and sins in many ways that seem to be more common, generally speaking, to men. 
And today we see in large part a passivity of men. And we see women trying, even in the public square, to fight the battles that don't belong to them. But what can happen, and so easily happens today, is that women can begin to try to control the people around them, manipulate and lead them, all the while calling their husband or their pastor their head. But rather than governing their emotions, their emotions are then used to manipulate the people around them. And I want to call us to be very careful here. I don't see this as a plague in our church by any stretch of the imagination, but it certainly has been before. Where women will begin to govern the people around them all the while calling their husband their head and their pastor their authority. By using their emotions and when they don't get what they want, there's going to be hell to pay. It's a manifestation of the fall. It's it's an emotional manipulation tactic. And God has called women to a beautiful role. And I want you to look at it in Scripture. To manage their homes. To love and to submit to their husbands. To train their children to be generous to others. To cast their house into a home filled with industry and productivity. The love and lordship of Jesus Christ to be welcoming and hospitable. And I am so thankful. I really am so thankful to be in a church where that really is, that's the, that's the ladies in our church. You say, you're just sucking up now. Listen, I want to make one thing clear. I don't suck up. I've been fired once from a church and almost fired twice in the middle of two church splits. <laughs> I tend not to worry about too much what you think. There's another church for you down the road. Like, it doesn't bother me. (laughs) But I really am thankful for the ladies in our church who model this so beautifully. And the men and the the culture that has been recovered of men seeking to lovingly lead their wives, to rule their homes, to figure forth Christ in the church. And I believe there's two twin pillars that a husband seeks to use in order to do this and should seek to do this. He has in his armory authority. There is an authority that a man has in his home, an authority that should be used and exercised. And also in his artillery is affection, a love that is displayed so that all who are under his leadership are flourishing under that rule and growing as far as can be helped into the likeness of Jesus Christ, wanting to submit to his laws. Welcome to the holy and happy home that we are seeking to model and display as a witness before the world. And then children are honoring and obeying their parents and doing so gladly. And they are doing so Because they want to honor the Lord as the goal and obey Him as their heavenly Father. Understanding what it means to be under authority and creating cultures of honor in our home, cultures of honor in our church, that the world, the community, the state would say that is how community life ought to be done. If it is ruled by King Jesus, that is what it ought to look like. That is a holy and happy people that are repenting of their sins and fighting against it to submit to Jesus Christ. And the Bible teaches us together from the very opening chapters of the book of Genesis that we are to rule and subdue the earth, to take dominion as those who are made in the image of God. We therefore multiply and we extend the good image of God that is encapsulated in the 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 lives of our children and of all people. And we have them and we send them. And as a church, we raise them up. And as families, you train them and we send them. And what happens as we take dominion is we bring order. We bring excellence. We bring usefulness. We bring beauty. We bring blessing to every dimension of all creation. So in every godly endeavor, in every area of all of life, we desire to show forth the glory of God. Friends, in your work, whatever that looks like, day in and day out, you do that to the glory of God. 
I come from a generation where as soon as someone began to read a few more verses of the Bible from others and they could carry themselves and speak in a winsome way, all of a sudden the whole church said, boy, you need to be a pastor. And now we have an entire generation of fallout pastors and you can't wonder, can't help but wonder how many of them really should have never been pastors. They should have been carpenters and plumbers and politicians and journalists and and all the rest and mothers that manage their homes and help their husbands and and God is using those godly endeavors to pierce the lordship of Christ and to show forth the whole counsel of God and the greatness and goodness of our sovereign God throughout the world friends listen to me what you do matters how you live matters How you build matters. How you change the diapers of those precious babies matter. How you you do carpentry matters. It all matters. And in the midst of it, we're making disciples of every nation and generation with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm so sick of living amongst the Gnostic generation that says the only thing matters is had someone said a prayer of salvation, but has not taught people how to live in their everyday lives and vocations and homes and in workplaces. And what a beautiful thing it is when you get a hold of that. People will always pour themselves into something. People will always pour themselves into something. And there is an entire industry of fishing and hunting and mechanics and everything else waiting to gobble up the time. But when you can get a hold of the reality that God has given you a mission and you clarify what that mission is and you have a helpmate when God deems that time and appropriate measure... And together you take that on for the glory of Jesus Christ. Whether it be works of industry or creativity, technology, gardens, administration, academia, academia, arts, businesses, training children. What a glorious thing. Men are prophets, priests, and kings of their homes. Women are helpmates to their husbands. Productive and industrious managers of their home. Trainers of their children. And God says, the Bible says that that we have also in the church singles. There are extenuating circumstances that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 7. And those singles are serving the Lord. And those who are in the homes of their parents are being a blessing to their homes. And the Bible says that widows, particularly those who are truly widows, 1 Timothy 5 says... They're cared for by the church. They're giving their lives to bless the church. They've washed the feet of the saints. And they've found useful ways to glorify and honor God by blessing his people, extending his kingdom. The Bible speaks to every station in all of life. Wherever you are, he has given you a purpose and a mission. And you'll not be happy until you engage in it. Look with me at number two. We've got to speed up here. I want you to see how we should then live in the church. Look with me in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four gives us a jurisdictional authority of the church. Did you know that God has given to the church an authority and a responsibility? That you and your family, if you're in Christ, are to be a part of And there are overlapping responsibilities and authorities, but there is an authority that God has given to the church that he did not give to you as an individual Christian. And he's given a a responsibility to us collectively. I want you to see Paul's instructions in Ephesians chapter 4. This is how we are to live as a covenant community. This is the target, friends. He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, 
bearing one another in love. This is the context of a local church. Verse 3, you say, why did Paul say that we're to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Why did Paul call us to bear with one another in love? Are you seriously asking that? Have you been a part of a church for longer than five minutes? Anybody? (laughs) You understand that one of the first virtues that you have to cultivate is how to bear with people unlike you who drive you insane. And to do it in love. And to display the same love to the people around you who drive you crazy. That Jesus Christ displayed to you when you were a rebel to his throne. And learning to maintain the unity of God's spirit among us. Paul would later allude in Ephesians 6 to the fact that there is a war going on. There are soldiers in that army through the local church. Theologians have understood us to be now the church militant, but we must understand there is an enemy and it is not with one another, friends. It is not with one another. Unless that is we find wolves and goats in our midst, but not among true believers. So look at the blueprint in verse 4. There is one body and one spirit. And he says in verse 7 that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then we see in verse 11 the blueprint he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Friends, we, our family is really enjoying and has gotten into archery. And the first thing you understand with archery is you got to understand where the target is. Hmm. Aim small, miss small. What's the target? Here's the target. The target is knowledge of the Son of God. He says the unity of the faith to mature manhood, to the measure of of the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, childlike faith, but not childish, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What a beautiful picture that God has given us here. And so we have these pillars beginning with family worship. We're worshiping God every day, reading his word and praying in our hearts, in our homes with the people around us. Uh, But then there's corporate worship. We're gathering together every Lord's day to worship our risen king. And we're coming ready and eager uh, to hear his word, to be blessed by him, experience forgiveness and to go forth in God. God has given a responsibility to the church to preach the word of God, to administer the ordinances, and to practice church discipline. And this is an authority that God has given to the church that has been then back, just as the rod is given to the home, church discipline has been given as a tool in God's grace to redeem erring Believers, Church discipline with excommunication is a blessing that God has given as an authority to the church. So what is the purpose of the church? What is our aim? We exist to worship God as supremely worthy. First and foremost, we gather to please God. We gather to please God. I love how one pastor said it. People talk about, you can't say that. It's going to be offensive. He said, people have been offending God their whole life. Say something offensive and let them be offended for a while. 
We're not here to try to fill as many seats as possible. Matter of fact, every now and then I think, man, we can't continue to hold so many people. I'm, I just need to ring one of those zingers out there that's just not going to sit well and maybe clear the parking lot a little bit and make more room for those who are really going in the same direction with us. And then more people show up the next week. <laughs> Which shows that God is doing something. There, there has to be some sparks of revival where God is bringing a like-mindedness. And he's bringing people together and we're anchoring our lives together in the context of the worship of the local church. First and foremost, to worship God and to please him. The church exists also to disciple one another as believers. We gather weekly to worship God, and then throughout the week, we practice the one another's of Scripture. Where's the Sunday school class? Where's all of the programs? I don't, I don't really know. I think I lost them all. We're just trying to live organically with one another, to love one another, to know one another, to warn one another, to correct one another, and to live in fellowship with one another. This is how God has designed the Christian life to edify and stir up one another that we live and love and fight together. And the church exists, thirdly, to the, worst, to the witness of God to the world. The witness of God to the world. In our church covenant, we resolve to love Christ supremely, to come together regularly, to care for one another graciously, to serve together faithfully, to witness together diligently, to walk together righteously. So through the ordinary means of grace, we preach the word, we partake of the ordinances, we care for and love one another in Christ all the way to heaven, and we continue to live out all of the commands of Scripture and the implications of the gospel and the whole counsel of God. And every day, all day, we are seeking to advance the kingdom of light. To bring forth the glory and gospel of God to bear on everything we put our hands to. To see men and women, boys and girls come to faith in Christ. To see the aroma of Christ. And to see his excellence and handiwork in every way. And finally, number three. How should we then live not only in the family and in the church, but how should we live in society? Look with me in your Bibles at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 would be the go-to place that would summarize what much of the rest of Scripture would work out. And we've seen many, many of these principles in Ezra and Nehemiah. We're not just a pietistic people who keep all of these principles to ourselves. The Bible teaches us how to conduct our affairs and how to live in the wider culture. The, the Bible also gives authority to the civil magistrate and gives us responsibility for how to live outside of our homes and churches. Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. God is sovereign over all things. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Listen to the prescription that God has given for how this is to be lived out. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. And you almost can't read that without chuckling in the society that we live in. But this is how it's supposed to work. They're not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. Authority is not a bad thing. Authority is... When under the rule of God, a good thing instituted by God. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. 
For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Having been ruled rightly in our hearts by Jesus Christ, expressing God-honoring rule in the home and living it out in the church, we then seek to be peaceful, productive citizens in the larger society. We are the kind of people by nature who now are hardwired by regeneration to want to submit and honor those that God has placed us under authority. That has been learned and instilled or should have been since we were in the laps of our parents and our children are in our laps. So the responsibility of the civil magistrate is to punish evil and to protect and praise what is good. And they have been given the authority of the sword, a discipline to enact it. But as you know, we live in a day today when rulers are now a terror to good conduct and they approve of bad conduct. They are putting Christians who march out at the front of abortion clinics and, and everything else in jail and then they're promoting anarchy in all of our major cities. Chapter 24 of the London Baptist Confession lays out the concern of civil government by stating that God, the supreme Lord and King of the whole world, has ordained civil authorities to be under him and over the people for his own glory and the public good. For this purpose, he has armed them with the power of the sword. Uh, what do swords do? <laughs> they kill people. To defend and encourage those who do good and to punish evildoers. So that is backed by force and it should be governed by the laws of God. The confession says, because civil authorities are established by God for the purpose stated... We should submit in the Lord to them and everything lawful that they require. We should submit not only for fear of punishment, but also for the sake of conscience. We ought to make requests and prayers for kings and everyone in authority so that under their rule, we may leave, live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. So the flip side of that, as Jesus said, we render to Caesars the things that are Caesars and to God the things that are God's. We are expected to submit faithfully. And those who are in authority over us are expected under God to rule justly. And what leads us to the birth certificate of our nation is that a long train of of tyrannical usurpations had been endured with no recompense, with no answer, with no remedy that reached a fever pitch to where in the likeness of all of the reformers before and after and beyond, we begin to understand that to resist tyranny is a responsibility and a duty before God. And we don't welcome or delight in that day, but we are not wards of the state. We are subjects and citizens of the kingdom of God. And so what we envisioned before COVID is that the state would just come in with guns and say, do you denounce Jesus Christ? If you say yes, well, there's an answer there, but it... If you, if you won't denounce Jesus Christ, then I'm going to kill you. But it doesn't often happen that way. What happens is the state begins to lap up the jurisdictional authority that God has not given it in the home and in the church. And if we've learned anything over the last few years, we have learned that a government is to be ruled by God and that God has given us a responsibility when government completely runs outside of its reign and its lanes. And at that point, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. And so we do not submit to them in things that they require, which are not lawful, 
when they act completely outside of their God-given lane or jurisdiction, when they take which is not theirs, when we have an authority that is not legitimate, no less than a man who comes into your house trying to tell you what to do has no authority. Or when we have a legitimate authority who is completely acting outside the jurisdiction of authority that God has given him. And when possible, we will suffer and bear everywhere we can. But as Samuel Rutherford said, the king is not the law. The law is the king. So they exist for the flourishing of those under whom they have responsibility. And this is the day in which we live, where we're having to work out a political theology. And all who are caught up in the middle, like I was, of the gospel center movement decades ago, found themselves very flat-footed in 2020 when we realized God has told us how to live and how to respond to this. And so we must be prepared. We must be equipped. We must be prepared to honor authority, but to stand in accordance with the convictions and principles of God's word and to guard his house even if at the sake of our life. But in many ways, I believe today, we find ourselves like the rich young ruler. We've gotten so comfortable with prosperity, with stuff. We've gotten so comfortable with cultural capital. We've gotten so comfortable with so many flashy, fancy, comfortable things that God has given us And we've realized that it will take courage and sacrifice and completely abandoning many, if not all, of those things in order to do what is right. Friends, right now, today is the day that we need to be prepared to live in times such as this. We're living in the brinks of moral chaos. We have a major election ahead. We have homes that are broken down. We have hearts that are completely estranged from God with no care or concern for his law, now is the day, listen to me, if anybody ought to know how we then should live, Christians and the local church should be the place where we can freely open the scriptures and say, this is what God provides and expects of us and of all who would live for him. There is a rule that one would be glad to be under. And it would take surrendering and repenting of one's own self-rule and sin and submitting to the good rule of God in all of his law. There is a king above all kings. There is an authority which enables every other authority. A father, a pastor, a president... A civil magistrate does not have direct authority. He has a derived authority. And all of this authority, all of these inalienable rights begin and end and come from God. They're anchored in God. And the most fundamental confession of the Bible and of the Christian life is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the response of the people of God can and is and should be and we love it so and we want to live rightly under his lordship in whatever station God has given to us it's not flashy it's not fancy it's not popular it will get you canceled But friends, this is Christianity 101. What God has called of his church has not changed, even though everything else seems to. Do you love Jesus Christ? Are you found in him? Are you free and forgiven in Jesus Christ? Do you know the peace that only he can offer? You can do every self-help fix that you want, and you'll find yourself disgruntled, discontent, always missing the mark, things never coming together, frustrated. But if you would be ruled by Jesus Christ, and if I would seek to continue to bring ourselves under his good law, oh, what a 
What a glorious state that is. And it's offered freely to all who would repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the liberty that you give us. We thank you for the freedom that we have through the cross of Christ. Thank you for the salvation that you have effected through your life, death, and resurrection. And the whole counsel of God is a compass, a map, that we would not live aimlessly wondering, but we would live with hope and meaning and purpose. Lord, here we are, a mess, a basket full of weaknesses and mistakes, thoroughly threaded from beginning to end with sin. And here we are this Lord's Day. We offer ourselves anew to you. We've asked your forgiveness for our sins. We want to be freely pardoned and found in Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, would you give us the strength and grace, each to his own and his need, to live faithfully and fruitfully and loyal, loyally to you. Lord, help us to be a holy and happy people, advancing forth the kingdom of light in a world of darkness, that Jesus Christ would be shown forth as a good and glorious Lord of all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.